just changing scale here and uh, looking more at the company's, uh, level, the company's level, looking at engagement, ESG engagement, and more specifically, we're going to focus on uh, control, com control companies, right? So, you know, broad questions are, you know, does ESG company uh, differs in uh, when there is a controlling shareholder or a controlling coalition of, share of shareholders that have, you know, more power in their, uh, the power to control the firm, or, you know, or is it the same, you know, is it, or, and, and, and what do we need to think of in this, uh, in this context? Um, so we, we just heard that tilting is uh, the preferred strategy, but, you know, let's, let's see what's going on in the field uh, as far as engagement is, is concerned. And to do that, actually, I'm going to follow the invitation of Marco Venturozzo, I need to say the last name because so many Marcos in this room, uh, who said this morning that, you know, we were in the setting of uh, uh, anatomy lab, right? Anatomy theater. We have the lighting, we have the steep, uh, the steep uh, line of chairs. Um, so we're not going to engage into live dissection, you know, researcher, <laughs> but we're going to try and engage into live research, you know, hoping to, you know, keeping you engaged. So the way we're going to proceed, we're going to hear from the field. So from, from, uh, first from Michael, and then from Frederica, who are going to tell us, you know, what's, what's going on in, pract in practice. And then before your eyes, you'll hear research live and a framework for these findings being proposed by uh, Laura. And of course, like every good magician, you know, Laura has a lot of practice and, you know, on, 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 on research in our bag, so that might, that might help the live, fra the, live, uh, the live framing. Okay, so this, uh, this being said, so I'll ask uh, Michael to uh, first uh, share with us. Uh, Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks, uh, thanks all for the inv invitation and the, uh, the possibility and the ability to speak uh, today. Uh, so I'm Michael Skovic. So I work at uh, BNP Paribas Asset Management for 14 years now uh, in charge of, uh, of the stewardship team, so really in charge of the, the voting and engagement. We are quite active on CDP, climate action, so everything that I heard this morning was, uh, was, really, was really great and, uh, and really involved on that. Um, I'm going just to, to introduce a little bit um, BNPAM, just to give you why, uh, to, to give you the reason why I'm going to speak like, like this, because of course uh, you will see uh, after that, but if you're, uh, if you're having a focused portfolio and a large portfolio, of course uh, you are not going to have the same approach. Uh, so our organization, uh, we, we manage more than 500 billion of euro under asset management. Uh, when we have to uh, analyze our investment universe, you're talking about uh, uh, 15,000 uh, company to analyze. We invest in 4,000 company. Uh, so to set you the stone, that's a big challenge. We're a big team, we have 30 people now on the sustainability team, but it's still a small team if you compare to the overall uh, number of company to, uh, to analyze and to engage. So that, that's a challenge for us. Um, and, um, and this is why when we are going to assess a company and the expectation that we have uh, towards, uh, towards a company, towards the ESG practices, it's not going to be the starting point, the, the, uh, the, share, the, the capital, and if it's a controlled company or not. That's the starting point. The starting point is it's a listed company. Uh, and we're going to look at the listed company. We're going to compare to peers uh, if it's a controlled company or not. I mean, that's not a big deal at, at the starting point because we're starting from a big, big number of companies to analyze. If you, I, I'd like to be concrete. Let's take automobile sector. Volkswagen, Stellantis, General Motors, whatever. I mean, it's an automobile company. They are facing the same challenges. Volkswagen is quite concentrated ownership, but the starting point is the challenge that they have environmentally, socially, uh, are quite the same. Governance, I will come back. There are, there are, of course, difference, but the starting point is looking at the same challenge and more looking at uh, same criteria uh, and uh, a sector analysis uh, to, to start with the, the analysis. Um, the, the experience, and that's not an academic but more practitioner uh, practice, is you tend to have um, family or state-owned or concentrated company anyway that tend to be less transparent on their environmental and social dimension compared to, 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 to non-concentrated companies. That's the overall uh, framework that we tend to see. And of course, I mean, on governance, there are some differences. You have 
the uh, majority uh, shareholders that tend to be on the board. We're looking at classic criteria such as uh, board oversight, independence of the board. So technically, of course, concentrated company will might be uh, have negative effect of uh, of some scores on governance uh, because you're at the starting point. Investors like us are going to use the same framework, even if it's not the ideal way, but that's, that's the practical way we do it. Um, and uh, so, so that's for the starting point, I guess, on the analysis. Um, then, of course, when it comes to engagement, uh, the engagement will take into account specificity, will dig in, and will be uh, will trying to, uh, to, to, to do and to take into account all specificity of the sector. And, of course, the share capital of the company will be an important one. But again, it's going to be a reduction. Uh, we need to choose our battle. We are leading 10 companies on Climate Action 100. That's an example. Uh, but part of the starting point of investing in 4,000 companies, we engage. And when I say engage, really have deep engagement, a lot of time effort that, con that are concentrated basically on 300 companies. So it's a limited scope. We need to pick our battle. That's a, that's a big challenge of, of our industry. And of course, uh, a controlled company uh, will be quite different than a non-controlled company. And I will say even a, within controlled company, you will have different type of company. Are you having a company where uh, the majority shareholder is also the founder, is also the CEO? It's totally different versus a company that, uh, that has a majority shareholder that is part of the board potentially, have an external CEO, can be active, passive. You're having really an, a, a different dynamic and, of course, a different engagement to whom you're going to speak with, about which subject, it's quite different. Um, we, we tend to have, um, of course, challenge of uh, challenge, I think, on, uh, on concentrated company when we engage practically, is that you have limitation on what we can do, I think, on its real investor side. Um, we're minority shareholder on every company. Uh, that's, that's our position as a, as a global institutional investor. But if we take a uh, non-concentrated company, you have some escalation mechanisms that exist that will be harder for controlled company, of course. And um, to, I will give you two concrete examples that, uh, that we had uh, as an action uh, and to, to, to give you uh, where we are. We, we've been engaging uh, a lot in a topic that we call corporate, uh, climate lobbying. Uh, which is basically, if I summarize it quickly, making sure corporates are doing lobbying activities in line with climate change challenge. Uh, and we've been uh, pushing this message to what concentrated, non-concentrated company. Um, we have been facing uh, engagement with ExxonMobil, which is not the easiest company to engage on, but it's not a concentrated company. Uh, like every engagement, you want to start by building an engagement relationship, trying to solve obtain what you ask for without the need to escalate. Well, it didn't work well with, the, with Exxon. We had to escalate. We filed a shareholder pro proposal. Well, it was debated at the SEC. The SEC didn't approve the first time. Finally, it went to a vote last year. We obtained 63% of support by investor. And this year, well, we filed again the shareholder proposal. At the end, we withdrew and the company positively report what we were asking for. Not going to go into details, still works to be done, but we managed to get results. There was the escalation, a shoulder proposal backed by investor, and we managed to get a result. We had the same case with UPS uh, this year, uh, and we filed a shoulder proposal, exactly the same topic. We obtained 30% of support. Why? Because, well, it's another problem of some type of concentrated company. It's a concentrated company on voting rights. You have multiple voting shares at UPS, so you have a, a control through, through multiple voting rights. But we're in a situation, concrete situation, where, okay, well, we had to escalate. We didn't, uh, we didn't, for, we didn't manage to get uh, an outcome with the, I would say, normal engagement, soft engagement. But the problem is now we, we didn't have a back from majority investors. So even if it's advisory vote, well, we'll see. Maybe we'll manage uh, the story is, uh, is more new for UPS and it's that here. But it's going to be really more complicated because while well, the message is you didn't get back from, uh, didn't get the majority vote, even if 
counting minority investor, we get majority support if you were, didn't have multiple voting shares. But um, the point is of this example is I think the challenge uh, for institutional investor when you are in concentrated ownership uh, is that uh, you cannot, there are form of execution that you can do, but if there is no willingness from the company uh, to, uh, to listen to you, your, their majority shareholders, they can still have the decision power and you might be in a blocking point and uh, if there is no willingness for the company to engage, uh, to, 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 to engage and, and, and understand your point. Uh, and uh, and that, so, so I'm, I have no idea if I'm, uh, if I'm over my time, uh, but, um, but <laughs> no, and I, I, will, I will open and uh, we can open anyway the discussion. But um, I think that that's the biggest, the biggest difference uh, for me, for our experience as a large investor is, uh, and it's, an, it's a negative example that I gave. There are some positive examples, of course, of concentrated company, uh, if there is this openness of dialogue. Uh, but the, clearly the escalation uh, practices is more challenging. The other examples that I, and I'm going to finish there, uh, to open and that we've seen, especially uh, on, uh, on initiative like Climate Action 100, is of course if you're a concentrated company, you're owned by the state, to give an example, uh, not naming company, but you will figure out a lot of companies are in this situation. Well, it's really challenging to obtain uh, commitment from a corporate uh, that would be different than its own government. Uh, so you tend to have a climate, a climate plan uh, for a controlled company uh, owned by a state that will be a replicate of the government's action. And that's logical, that's normal, but when you engage and when you have demand and ask more, while well, you have this limitation. So really, really, uh, really have to approach, uh, approach differently when it comes to engagement. Uh, and, uh, and, but the starting point is, that I, I guess, the demand and Climate Action 100, the demand are the same if you're a concentrated or an unconcentrated company. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're gonna have an interesting discussion, I guess, on influencing the companies. My name is Friederike Helfer. I'm a partner at Sevian Capital. Sevian Capital is the largest dedicated European constructive activist investor. And um, I'll first start by clarifying uh, how we actually stand towards ESG. Uh, because we're clearly not labeling ourselves ESG, but ESG is a very highly integrated part uh, of our approach. As a constructive activist, uh, we're holding a concentrated portfolio and we are highly engaged in our companies. So the G in ESG has always played a very instrumental role. Uh, it's been the core of our strategy of what we do. When it comes to E and S, I think that has for a long time um, been more a risk management approach. We hold companies for five, sometimes 10 years. We don't sell in and out very quickly. So over that time horizon, of course, it plays an important role that a company is not kind of in structural decline, caught up in adverse regulation. And so it has always played, in terms of risk mitigation, a very important role. That has, however, changed over the last um, years or so. I think we are focused solely on Europe, and there we increasingly see a real business case for especially E, um, engagement and investments. Just think about it, the carbon costs are rising, they're rising visibly. Uh, customers are more and more actually willing to pay up for green products, they demand green products. So we actually see on the longer term actually no big discrepancy between values and value. A company in their normal strategy should invest in decarbonizing. It is actually a positive business case. And that's how we approach it. That's also how we approach the engagement in uh, our companies. Um, I mentioned the most public initiative we have been having on the ESG is uh, last March. We have publicly demanded that all our companies incorporate ESG targets into their compensation. Now that is in itself a controversial topic, um, but so I need to, in a sense, clarify what we demanded was that these targets are measurable, significant, and upfront transparent. And I'm pleased to say that all of the companies have now included that as of 2022, so we have had a great uh, impact with that. 
why do we say this is such an important uh, measure to do? I think, uh, as has already mentioned be before and today, there is a lot of net zero commitments by 20, 2050. And what, what we have seen actually in real engagement is there is very little real action and there is very little tangible result that a management is actually really saying, what am I doing today to reach that in 30 years from now? And we all know that 30 years from now, that management team is most likely not going to be there to be held accountable for that. And uh, so, I th and also I think over a time horizon of a normal long-term incentive plan of three year, four year, five years, none of the immediate actions might be captured, neither in earnings nor in TSR, which are the most important kind of uh, KPIs used in compensation. And so I think it has been very important as well to focus and signal in the discussion that you need to pick something really measurable and tangible, what you will be doing, and you will, your incentive will actually be attached to that. Um, I am also on the boards of two of our portfolio companies, and so I can as well report a little bit uh, of the effects these engagements, but also other institutional engagement has had on the boards and on the discussion. And let me start with a very positive effect. I think all boards, the ESG topics and especially the uh, carbon emissions have become much, much higher on the agenda. It has triggered, uh, all the institutional engagement has really triggered higher transparency. So first of all, that the companies first of all look at where are we emitting, how are we emitting, what can we do about it. It has actually triggered a big debate about where should we be, how much should we invest, uh, which, which KPIs in terms of compensation is really what, uh, uh, what is relevant for us uh, because that discussion is extremely necessary. And in the best cases, it has really impacted strategy in terms of where do I want to focus my business uh, going forward. On the negative side, um, it's fair to say that the sheer amount of reporting and disclosure requirements um, being from the EU, uh, being it from various uh, uh, rating agencies, uh, plus, of course, institutional investors, which have their own frameworks and whatever, has created a, quite a big of frustration. Uh, it's also clear that many institutional investors speak mit, with many different voices. So you have the portfolio manager that says something. You have uh, stewardship uh, people that come with something. You have passive investors that don't change their holding anyways. So what does actually the management do with that if they feel there is no change at all? And that leads actually to many boards or managements then saying this is, this is purely a distraction. This is, I'm kind of, I'm handing that over to a team in investor relations. They should present some glossy slides and make a big presentation of what I'm actually doing, but it has nothing to do with my day-to-day -day business. And I think this is bad because it doesn't do the real need, the kind of the conviction I have that we need to work on reducing and attacking that with, with all of our brains and with every old capacity, it doesn't do that a favor. And so, one thing I would like to discuss here is how can institutional investors become more effective and more focused in really achieving something tangible or they risk being marginalized or diluted in the whole discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we'll, we'll hear from uh, the artist, uh, Laura, the framework, <laughs> oh, a, no. a possible framework. And then, we'll, then, we'll, uh, then I will ask... Um, uh, Frederick and, and Michael to react to what is uh, suggested by Laura, whether actually you know it makes sense, whether it enlightens you know your experience, whether you know you you know whether you know how you receive it, and we'll be able then to you know we'll have time to open up for Q and A. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about some research and I'm gonna talk about some facts, um, and we'll see if it fits into a framework. <laughs> the, um, but, but I would like to, to, to point out to, to begin with is um, that research by Marco and by Hans um, has, has shown that some of the most successful engagements come from coordinated actions of institutional investors. And so there, you know, as you've been talking about how you, how you select the firms, I think that, that becomes an important consideration um, but such investors have less influence when in firms that are more concentrated, as, as, as Michael has talked about. So, so in terms of um, some research that I've conducted with, with Simi Kedia and, and Zhang Zhu Wang, um, we show that hedge funds 
are more likely to engage with the firm when they're shareholders who would be more friendly to their goals. Um, and so this is because the hedge fund activists, they tend to have ambiguous relationships with the institutional investors because some of the institutional investors are very much in favor of their actions, others are, are, um, are not in favor of their actions. And, and you know, as Michael talked about, due to the relatively small holdings in the target firms, the activists need the cooperation of these other institutional investors. And so, so what we found was that activists were more likely to target a firm that had investors that we look at what they've done in the past and, and makes them appear to be more friendly to what the activists would do. Um, and we found that the engagements were more successful with um, um, uh, higher long-term stock returns and higher operating performance. So in, in, in summary, our evidence suggests that the composition of a firm's ownership has significant effects on hedge fund activists. Now, I want to give some facts. Um, concentration of firm's ownership has increased greatly in the last decade. According to MSCI, as of February this year, controlled companies, which they define as those where the top owner holds more than 30% of the voting power, accounted for more than 46% of the M MSCI ACWI index and um, that was a 44% increase from 2015. Um, but one caution I would put here, we don't really know, particularly for European firms, what their ownership is. Because 39, per, well, according to, this is according to something BlackRock said, 39% um, of the ownership is unidentified because those shareholders are not under a requirement to report or they have an exemption uh, from reporting. So, so anything we know about European firms, you have to take uh, with a grain of salt because we don't have complete information. Um, but what they do know is, is the balance of share ownership between institutional and non-institutional investors varies quite a bit across countries, which, which you probably know. But this, this can make a, a difference in, in uh, being, being targeted. Um, and um, uh, this also, there, there's a large percentage of companies um, in the MSCI Europe index that, as, as Marco was talking about yesterday, issues the, the dual class or the, um, the loyalty shares. And so, again, that concentrates the ownership. And we've heard this morning from Patrick and from Philip about engagement and how important engagement is. Um, and and it, it depends on the concentration of the firm's ownership, as, as uh, uh, Michael and Federico have, have said. Um, it also seems, if you think about concentration of ownership, we, we think about it in, in terms of you know, the founding families or the, the governments. But there's also the issue of concentration of ownership by institutional investors, by the big index funds, by the large sovereign wealth funds. And, and I would argue that those are two very different kinds of um, uh, concentrations, which you would probably argue as well. But, but I want to give an example about Exxon as well, also, because engine number one, which was the small activist hedge fund that got, that did a proxy fight with Exxon um, two years ago, I think, and and got board members, three board members, put on put on Exxon. They were successful because they were able to go talk to the very large institutional investors. They had the backing of, of the California teacher system. They were able to go talk to Vanguard, BlackRock, and um, uh, State Street, as well as other big indexers. And so so that actually made it a little bit easier for them. One of the things that they told me, and this was before the vote, that they were very concerned about is that 44% of Exxon's ownership was individual investors, which made it more difficult for them to try to reach those investors, particularly because a lot of them were individual investors in Texas. Um, and so, so, again, there's this question about the, the family ownership versus uh, concentration versus the, um, the institutional investor concentration. The other thing that I think, and maybe we'll have time to talk about this or not, is if the big institutional investors do what BlackRock's planning to do and give the, the vote 
to, um, to their clients. Uh, so that, that's gonna, the, gonna change, the, change the voting rights. Um, and so just one other thing I wanna talk about is, is and I think Michael kind of referred to this, that, that there's some family owners that are more amenable to, to say environmental issues and, and um, in, in some work um, uh, with, with Nadia Sakeya and, uh, and Stu Gillen about, and we were looking just in Sweden, we find that family ownership makes a difference in terms of whether they're more amenable to, uh, to investor demand, investor pressure for environmental issues. So um, I, will, I will stop with this. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. So we have three points, I think, here yeah, mainly. So coordination of uh, institutional investors, um, the level of friendliness of shareholders and perhaps controlling shareholders uh, towards ESG, and uh, this idea that you know the difference between uh, con family concentration or institutional investors uh, concentration. So does this um, echo your experience, uh, Michael and uh, Frederica? Perhaps you know some examples or illustrations um, on, on this on these themes. Michael, why don't you start? Okay, no problem. No, no, that's, um, I mean, sorry, I'm not going to disagree with what, <laughs> what has been said, but um, I, I, I might just have, a, but it's maybe a different thematic for me. Uh, I, I will not con consider um, uh, a company that is, uh, has a concentrated uh, institutional investor uh, based as a concentrated company, but that I totally understand this is semantic, but for but me... But Michael, uh, feel but, free, because, you know, if, we dis if there's disagreement no. <laughs> in the panel, it makes it for a much more interesting panel. So just, you know, well, well, be well, as controversial as so, you so, wish. So, so I understand totally the, the point. The fact is, uh, is it's true that um, you have more and more from the top three uh, shareholder, uh, a big, uh, big proportion now that is, that is owned by those, uh, those top three uh, institutional investors, but it's still a minority shareholder per se. They are not going to con control uh, directly. Uh, but... In a way, uh, what, I'm, uh, what I understand the, the point is basically when we filed, and again, giving an example with Exxon, and we had the same case, we had to convince investors. So it was easier, of course, uh, if you have to convince uh, three big names that count 20, 25 percent uh, for, for them to vote on. What, why I'm not considering that it's a concentrated uh, company, in my view, it's because it's investors that are not part of the board, they are not going to be aligned 100% of the case with management, uh, they can still have different voice, and in that case, we managed to convince them to support our shareholder proposal, why Exxon board was against. So uh, that's why I tend to classify those companies a little bit different compared to a family uh, state companies, which 99% of the case will be fully aligned with management, and, uh, and it's a different dynamic, I guess. Um, the other point that maybe I want to, um, so it's, it's a disagreement without being a disagreement, I guess. Uh, but um, the other point that maybe I want to illustrate uh, that, uh, that resonate when, when you were speaking is, um, I, I said at the beginning, you need to uh, pick your battle as a especially large investor like us, but like every investor. And um, one of the things that we do when we have to look, okay, which company are we going to, we select topic, which topic are relevant, which sector, et cetera, which company we want to engage, of course, we look at our ownership, but we look at the, uh, uh, well, the time that we're going to spend and the likelihood of success and outcome. And that's going to be typically where the con uh, a concentrated company uh, might be not targeted because we know that we're not going to manage to have the outcome because of experience or et cetera. So we tend in practice to engage less with companies that will be controlled because the likelihood to that we will have a success and outcome is more limited and, uh, it's, and in a way and the escalation and whatever said. So in practice, uh, not, not backing a study here, but more the uh, more, more background of experience, uh, we will tend to concentrate, uh, to, to concentrate the effort on non-concentrated company <laughs> rather than concentrated company uh, in practice. I guess not much disagreement from my side. Uh, uh, either first point on the coordination. Uh, I guess we are not speaking concert party, which would kind of uh, uh, d d uh, lead to to many other uh, serious antitrust questions, but. All else equal, it's very important that several investors speak the same voice uh, if they really want to have an impact. 
Uh, this is very, very important uh, only if the management feels that what they're doing will be supported by several major shareholders and it can be very powerful to repeat almost that message, almost identical. Uh, will the management feel compelled to act? Otherwise, it's actually a nice trick to actually just play investors against each other. So to tell each investor, well, you want that, but the other investor wants that, and therefore it's it's equal, and therefore I continue with my uh, with my strategy. Uh, so very important. And back to my original uh, original point that, uh, for example, in compensation, you probably asked ten investors, you get twelve opinions and philosophies uh, about what is the right approach to compensation. The result is often that nothing happens. Another comment uh, on uh, controlling ownership or very large uh, ownership. Um, this is in many situations a, a blessing or it can be actually a hindrance to change at all. It's very clear that this is somebody who controls, who doesn't need to listen, which is also the benefit if that investor is convinced, then things will happen and things become much easier. Um, all the efforts of also kind of benefiting long-term owners in France or of uh, having A, B, C share classes, of course, I mean, they in ideal situations, if that investor is very good, they enables the company to do the right things without listening to a lot of noise, without uh, uh, needing to, re re to have the quarterly results and all the attention can focus on the long term. However, the downside is always it also cements the status quo. What if the existing investor, the controlling shareholder, thinks ESG is just a greenwashing modern phenomenon and is just disregarding it and therefore not actually uh, allowing a, a real debate around what the strategic decisions need to be now in order to be successful 10 years from now. Then this is exactly where sometimes very active or activist engagement is necessary. Even minority shareholders need to become even more forceful in order to enact change. So it is not, it's always, it depends on the quality of the long-term investor and is the responsible of a, of a con controlling investor to be on top of things and to change their minds and to adapt to a changing environment which we currently uh, really have. Thank you very much. So it will now be time to, um, to open up to, uh, to questions, if there, if, there are, if there are some. And as you are sort of, you know, gathering your thoughts, perhaps I use progressive chair to, to ask you a question, pushing a bit on you to say, you know, it depends on the, you know, it depends on the shareholders and these controlling shareholders. So, but could you, you know, could you tell us more, you know, is there a typology that we could sort of think of and even not going that far, but, you know, are there uh, trends that you can see? Uh, you know, controlling shareholders in, you know, in, in the northern, you know, in northern <laughs> countries are more sort of uh, engaged and more keen on ESG than in southern countries, or is this not true? Is there, you know, can you can you first illustrate and give us, you know, what what have you uh, what have you observed? Michael, do you want to start? Yeah, I'll go. Also, it. It depends, like everyone. <laughs> like no, it depends is a very good answer. It, it, anyway, as a lawyer, it, it depends is the best answer up. ever. You can uh, start any question, but you know, tell uh, us more. I guess, I mean, co coming back to, to an early point, I guess that um, for sure, if you're talking about the founder that is majority shareholders, that is a CEO, well, is on top of things. That could be positive, that could be negative, but the dynamic of engaging with, uh, with them is it's natural for investors to engage with top management, and in fact, you're just concentrated both uh, ownership and, uh, and executive power in one person. So it could be positive uh, or, or negative, but in a way, there is, it's one voice and it's easy, I guess. It's easier to track down. What could be more challenging is a company where um, you might have hard uh, vision of towards who's really in charge of. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the influence that could have uh, an important shareholder with an external CEO, that could be really tricky because you can have a great management in place, but at the same time, this, with great vision that could be long-term, on the uh, could, be, could be ESG friendly, uh, and sometimes decisions that could be taken uh, because you have a majority, uh, a majority control and the opposite can be true. So 
that's why I think it's important to, to see the dynamic of, uh, of also the, the structure where, where it is, uh, the way you're going to speak on. And usually, I mean, that's where we were say, saying we, we peak and sometimes we, constant, we, we, we have on our target list some companies with majority uh, shareholder, uh, shareholder uh, ownership that we kept and we engage because they, we know that we can manage to be constructive with them and because they are open to our vision and uh, we can manage to have outcome. But there are some companies, we just put it, okay, well, we do not need to engage with them. We're not going to go anywhere and they're not open to that. So that's, that's probably, so they, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not convinced that there is a geographic bias. Uh, there are some French companies that are open, others that are not, and that's true in all, probably all, mo most market, but I don't know if you, if you share, that, uh, share that view. Yeah, I fully agree. We, we are bottom-up and therefore really avoid stereotyping uh, investor classes or family owners. I think there is, a, you, you find And in your you experience, find you know, they change? You know, are you able to sort of, or, you know, instead of saying, yes. okay, you, they are, you know, who is what? So are people evolving? Let's put it that yes. way. Yes, I think it's in, especially in the area of ESG, things are evolving strongly. Thanks especially to, I think, a high attention in the media and also among institutional investors. And I think no investor can really now completely shy away from the topic. Um, and the more concrete it becomes, the better, actually. The more there is clear regulation, there is carbon cost, there is a clear cost associated with this, uh, the more natural it becomes for everybody to see that they have to just face it. Thank you. So Jennifer Hill? Yeah, Jennifer, you have a question? Yes, I do. Thank you. I've got a comment and then a question uh, for Laura. Um, so the comment is just simply to say Exxon, I think, is a fabulous example of what I think is really the US paradigm of um, coordinated activism, uh, where you have the hedge fund and they catalyze and then get the institutional investors on board. And, you know, that's absolutely right. That's how it happened at Exxon. But in other parts of the world, it's quite different. And I think it's always good to look at those alternative uh, paradigms outside of the US. Um, in other parts of the world, there will be no hedge fund leading. It will often just be coordinated action across institutional investors, across pension funds. Um, and I talked yesterday actually about um, shareholder activism in relation to the Rio Tinto scandal. There was not a hedge fund in sight there. It was local superannuation or pension funds in Australia that reached out across into, into Europe and the UK and brought those investors on board to um, to have activism. Um, when Rupert Murdoch, and I'm sorry being an Australian that I, I visited Rupert Mur Murdoch on America, when he moved News Corp to the US, um, that was one of the first coordinated institutional investor actions that I knew about uh, where global institutions came together to challenge putting in a, a poison pill. Um, so I know Marco's written about this form of paradigm in, in Japan as well. Um, now, that was a very long comment. My question goes to Laura's point, um, talking about the pass-through uh, initiative of BlackRock. Um, what do you think is driving that? Uh, is it just a love of, you know, true democracy or is it fear of pushback, political pushback of power, against powerful institutional investors and this is a a sort of a defense me mechanism? I, I think it is probably a combination, but I, but I do know that, that, that BlackRock has gotten a lot of pressure from their clients that they, that they want to vote certain ways. And so, so they're, you know, they're starting the, this with their large clients, um, but they're talking about having it go to retail investors. In my opinion, the retail investors, most of them are just going to let BlackRock do the vote. Um, but some of the large clients want this. And, and, and perhaps some of that comes from large clients that aren't happy with the way BlackRock's been voting. So it could be, it could come from political back, BlackRock. 
Sorry, the question was not for me, but I can just add. Uh, also, I think that, uh, I mean, to be honest, I quite fear a lot uh, if we have this trend because we're seeing regulator having this approach. And, uh, and the problem is that, uh, as you say, the problem is that, okay, well, if you're uh, in a big institution investor, that uh, asset owners that are giving the power, ke keeping, uh, keeping it uh, and decide to vote, uh, well, that, that's one thing. But as you say, I mean, the consequences of having um, non-professional investor, uh, especially for the ESG agenda, I fear that basically uh, it's going to be less pressure on corporate, less engagement in fact, because you're not going to, you're going to have less power as, uh, as investor. So our view, you might disagree, but our view is that I think that the tendency of the last 10, 15 years has been to Put, push, pre, put pressure for good reason on the investor community to do more, to engage more. And this tendency can just do a U-turn and go back and to say, okay, well, you're either you're doing too much the job for corporates and you should stop or not enough, whatever reason you, you believe in, but you might be, if we go on that direction, in really a change a shift towards the fact that, well, institutional investor don't have to uh, will not have more power coming going forward because they will they will not be entitled to, for their full uh, voting rights. So, so that's a, that's a big shift if we go that way. Yeah, of course, Nora, so I want to ask Michael and Federica what they think. It there's so much less shareholder proposals in the U.S. I mean in Europe than in the U.S. and and is that because of the concentrated ownership or is it just because of the culture the way this is turned out? Do you want to? I can start. Uh, I think this has a, a lot of a cultural um, uh, 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 context. In Europe, engagement is expected to be happening much more behind doors, and a full-fledged uh, attack in the open is usually entrenching everyone, uh, and, and a lot of uh, 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 companies have... Uh, have in that sense uh, more to, uh, I think also investors engage, engage have more to lose if they uh, go to the AGM and this is really the last resort. I think successful engagement happens much earlier and I think there's also enough papers as well that constructive engagement is more successful than if you uh, in, in, uh, in, in, uh, go into a full-fledged fight. Uh, it's also clear that in the US, maybe in some situations you have no other choice because uh, I guess you also have quite powerful CEO equal chairman, and you have less normal ways of engaging. Uh, uh, so it becomes very quickly, quickly and more importantly, uh, uh, directly controversial. Whereas in Europe, it's quite normal that you have shareholders on the board. It's quite normal that you have family shareholders that are engaged, that you have a dialogue, and that uh, in terms of a stakeholder model, you, you are more in discussions. And therefore, it's actually good that it doesn't end up in this big public fight, which just uh, means a lot of cost. And there might also be, if I might add, and the element of the constitutional um, um, structure of the firm, you know, sort of less, you know, in Europe, less uh, contractual, and this division of power between the board and the shareholders, you know, stronger. Perhaps, you know, shareholders are not in a position to suggest uh, yeah. strategy because this is a role, actually, of, of, yeah. of the board. But there's a lot of pressure on that. No, I agree. And uh, the legal system is different. I mean, you need not of markets. You need, like, 3% of the capital to file a proposal. It depends on each market. The, the subject could be limited, uh, even if it's part of the discussion, uh, a lot uh, to, come to what you have said. I mean, can you... Are you allowed to, uh, to, to, to file a proposal that is an advisory vote uh, on an environmental and social topic? Well, that's part of the big debate and not so easy in markets like France, Netherlands, Germany, uh, where you have boards sometimes with your argument says it's not the competency of the general meeting. So also it's, I, I agree with everything that was said, but also it's, uh, I think it's more, uh, it's more easy, even if the SEC has a, has changed uh, in the past uh, to, 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 to fight shareholder proposal in the US compared to Europe also. So that, that was the case was recently raised at Total and they decided, okay, no, this is, you know, the board is setting the strategy, but, you know, we hear you. So actually as board, we are, we are going to, you know, to take, to take this, this point on. Yeah. So Luca Enrique. Thank you. So the discussion has taken a, a nice uh, twist because um, now it's more about culture than uh, um, legal uh, tools that you may have to escalate. But I, I, I was puzzled by, by the fact that you found the legal tools as, as a not effective. 
not, not because they are not, uh, and there are, uh, there are weaker tools in Europe for sure, and if you have concentrated ownership, they, you get nowhere with them. But I was wondering, what is the role of uh, reputation in all this? So you would expect a controlling shareholder to care more, I, may, I, I would say, about uh, the family's reputation, the, the, the local reputation that they might have. And so it, when it comes to E and S, and, uh, E, G is another matter, of course, but when it comes to ELS, you would expect them to be more uh, reactive in, in a positive sense to, to this kind of activism, which was not what I understood from your... Yes. What is the heritage of personalism, <laughs> in a way? No, I think that, I mean, um, I tend to, to, if I do a shortcut, I would say, uh, tend to have um, concentrated companies that tend to have a lot of good practices on environmental social one sometimes better than non-concentrated company, not necessarily communicating them. Uh, because, I mean, it's all the, I mean, of course there are case by case, it depends, again, uh, but, but in general it tends, I agree, I mean, company, I mean, the family has been there for a long time, will be there for a long time, uh, so they, they have clearly a long-term perspective vision and normally environmental social uh, dimension also, of, of course will be taken into account. But, um, and the, I think that the, the challenge is, uh, uh, is the reputation also um, for investor to be on those talks when you don't manage to have outcomes. So you can have great practices, you can engage and trust the company that they are doing a great job. But if they are not perceived by the market, they are not transparent or perceived for whatever reason, uh, to, to, to be on the best in class, well, you tend to have this situation where you, you might going to, uh, to, to, to exit or reduce the risk or whatever because you just do not convince the companies that they should be doing a better job in communication. And we had cases like that that was unfortunately, I mean, uh, companies that we really trust, we've been an investor for a long time, they were viewed by the market as not great at all, mainly due to transparency. Well, they were majority ownership. They didn't care a lot with, with their transparency. Uh, and there are still a lot of transparency uh, elements that are taking into account on the environmental and social dimension. That's the reality. Uh, and they were not keen to, to, to change. So that, that's, that's sometimes uh, the problem that we can face it. Frederick, would you like to add something? Or, or we just move on to the next question? And so we have priority to answer. So Hannes, Hannes first, and then you know, over here, and then I have the third one here. Thank you. I think this is a question for Friederike. I'm not sure. Uh, we seem to grapple with the big picture question. I mean, many of the papers we're discussing uh, grapple with the big picture question, the trade-off between financial outcomes and, and other outcomes. And um, some years ago, we were asked while revising a paper, you know, using activist hedge funds as a, as a great laboratory because they are so laser focused on what the goal is and, and what not the goal is. And you can't just talk around it because you're engaging for a very specific reason. And we were asked, can you come up with evidence that, that of any hedge fund that is not, not, not driving a strictly financial goal? So can you find shareholder proposals on E and S rather than on G that are in public advocated for by an activist. And we searched. Maybe we missed something, but we couldn't find anything. I think this was six years ago. How much the world has changed and, and you know, engine number one and then possibly a shareholder proposals supported by Sebian. But my question is for you. If I, I can see the argument for transparency on E and S, that's very clear and it's very focused, so it makes sense. Um, if you use the activist hedge fund industry, let's say, as a maybe excluding Sebian to make it easier, how would you see the, the industry shifting or not shifting away from a pure and very understandable focus on the G to a more fuzzy approach that might include E and S, whether the industry actually will do this or it will remain a niche for an activist such as engine number one. Because the question, of course, is indicating, well, if, if activist hedge funds do this, this has broad implications for the remainder of the financial industry, which represents the other 99% of asset under management. So this is the, the thrust of my question. I hope it makes sense. Thank you. So uh, let, let's look at the incentives of a hedge fund. A hedge fund is paid if they make returns. 
and uh, activist hedge fund is used as a very broad uh, a place for order for many different strategies. There is uh, a very short-term angle of, uh, of almost like event-driven uh, arbitrage funds. They almost need to prove that they make on a quarterly basis uh, returns that are outperforming an index. I, it's difficult to speak for all and to be, make it very generic, but I think as a principle, look how they make money. I would doubt that they would really engage in things that actively, they knowingly re reduce their returns. And so I think a return maximization is kind of the key and the underlying. And on the long term, this is the same for Sevian. The only difference is the time horizon. We want to make and generate and have generated superior economic returns for our investors. That is our mandate and that is also back to a fiduciary duty. For us, ESG, and that's why we engage in ESG, it is because we firmly believe over the long term there is no uh, conflict uh, in that. Because we think if you disregard uh, the transition right now, you will face economic costs uh, in the future. And only if you focus it and really focus it on that part, it, it, it makes sense. I think, therefore, it is right to question sometimes some of the very public engagements, because what's often behind is an investment case. Uh, you could, for example, say ExxonMobil was just uh, very attractively valued. And yes, on top, you make uh, an ESG campaign, but you also made money. Um, and in some of the, 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 the analysis or whatever, I guess we should not, <laughs> avoid, I mean, we should not leave this, this, this mandate for the investment industry uh, out. Uh, same thing for the companies. I think there needs to be a business case for change, and that is more a demand for regulation, uh, for carbon costing, uh, for subsidies, for whatever, in order to induce a, 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 a market dynamic which has been extremely successful to reallocate capital where it will generate uh, the best return. Everything else is, is, uh, is, 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 is maybe morally right, is maybe the right thing to do, but I, I don't believe it will have a very long-term lasting effect. I think for a certain time, and, and, and there, got, there has been some historical paper on it, there has also been not a question of what do I need to pay for ESG engagement. Um, with some recent data, this is actually changing. We will see how this is happening. I think as soon as this question and this trade-off is made, as investors really need to think how much do I need to give up in order to be kind of ESG uh, uh, focused, this is going to be uh, much more difficult. Uh, I, uh, yeah. Laura, please, yeah. I okay. haven't heard the, the word millennial this morning yet, but now it's coming in, yeah. I just want to make one point, which I've kind of heard in here, and, and there's this assumption that ESG has a cost. I heard this yesterday. If, if environmental and social factors are risk, and we, we've heard a lot this morning from Patrick and Philip about there being risk, then there is no, no that this is soft or, or non-financial. That was all I wanted to say. Okay. Yeah, I think. Um Thank, thank you. So we have two two questions, and I will take both of them as a bouquet, yeah. and then you know our panelists can can, uh, can answer. So I think uh, I have an answer to your question, which actually comes to you, which is um, the engine number five strategy was put forth by Charlie Penner, who's the former general counsel of Jana, um, and uh, for years at Jana he was trying to start an ESG hedge fund. Jana is a shareholder activism fund, and he was unable to do it. He eventually left Jan and sold this strategy to engine number five. He's left engine number five now. It's, and there's sort of been a backlash just three weeks ago. They started a new ETF in the US called Drill, which is designed to compete with IYE, which is BlackRock's ETF. And so it's unclear whether that strategy will have a secular, uh, will be secular. But I think my, my question is more from a US perspective and particularly from California. A lot of the ESG and control companies, we do have a lot of control of the companies in the US that are dual class stock, is driven by uh, the employees. So if you speak to the CEOs out in California in particular, they say it's not so much the shareholders are BlackRock, it's really because our employees are demanding that we do at least the E and the S. And I'm just curious in Europe how much that's a factor or other stakeholders um, in, in sort of uh, dealing with control companies. Okay. Thank you very much. So the role of employees, and but before answering, also here, 
Your question, please. Thanks. Um, my question is um, more for um, Michael and Frederica, and it's about um, the actual correlation that we have, uh, especially in the automotive sector as a result of the decision of the um, EU institutions to ban cars in uh, fossil fuel, um, combustion cars in 2035. And obviously, I mean, he, 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 this is the first probably big example of uh, um, transition risk, legally driven, which actually impacts in a substantial way um, European economy, because obviously France, Italy, and Germany are, for a number of reasons, we rely on the automotive industry and the supply chains as well. So my question is more um, whether um, stewardship um, um, is actually, and those who are involved in stewardship are actually ready to deal with the uh, technological risk, um, assessing the transition risk properly, and understanding exactly how to uh, put the right pressure on the um, concentration or non-concentration on the CEOs of, in the automotive industry was so critical for our economy in some respect, in some cases also state-owned, what is going to be the strategy that eventually is going to be pan out in the, in the coming months and years? It would be the first test, I think, in Europe for stewardship. So I was wondering whether you have any ideas about it. Okay. So, and we only have a few minutes left, so I'll ask you for perhaps, you know, concentrated answers. And you can, to, you know, there's more time after over lunch to, to explore that this issue. That will be difficult for me. Sorry. Um, no, so on, on the first one, uh, my thought is clearly, I mean, employee is a big, uh, big driver in, uh, in Europe. I mean, you have customer, employee, uh, clearly. And especially, I mean, for, from, a, from a recruitment perspective, I mean, as of today, millennials, if you want to speak the, the word. I mean, if you want to recruit mill millennials, uh, the way uh, your company is going to deal with climate change, environmental, social matters is key to recruit someone. I mean, if you're not well positioned, especially on our sector, banks that do not attract as many people that it used to be, it's a big challenge and it's viewed to, to be sustainability, to, to have a sustainability agenda is key for us as investors, but it's perceived as a key from an HR perspective and to be able to keep your employee, attract new talent, etc. So that's definitely a big, uh, big part of why uh, the agenda is, uh, is strong on that. And, uh, and the second question, quickly, I think that we're, uh, it's really an interesting topic that won't be able to do in a concentrated answer, but I, I think that we're working a lot what we call just transition thematics, so making sure that typically you need to change industry like the automobile sector, but changing it like it, like it does can have huge social consequences. Uh, so that's all the debate towards just transition uh, and, and making sure uh, the, uh, the industry is changing, but not by basically replacing all their employee and, uh, and reducing costs, which is a risk. I mean, electric, electrical uh, cars are easier, uh, less, uh, less, less, uh, less issue regarding the engine and uh, less people to, to build in and new New, new skills to, 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 to be in charge. So just making sure that you're doing a just transition uh, is, is a big challenge, I think, and will be uh, on the coming year. Thank you, Frederica. And Laura, you have the last word. So I agree. I, I won't repeat what uh, Michael just said. Two, two things maybe to add. I'm on the board of a German company, which is 20 people and 10 of which is employee representatives. Uh, so there is a very strong voice in many European countries coming up uh, from the employees. Unfortunately, the unions tend to embrace the S and the job security much more over the environmental. And uh, now coming also especially to the automotive industry, also the polluting industry, this is a huge stretch for the employees. Because as soon as it starts to be either or, you know, either job security or reducing pollution, this is almost unbearable for, for many stakeholders. Uh, uh, and it's gonna be a big, uh, it's gonna be a big challenge, especially I would say in the, in the, in the automotive industry. Um, not, not making that task any smaller. Um, this is indeed a big transition and a lot of, uh, I think government intervention and help that will be needed. What I think would, will happen just for publicly listed companies and for companies to invest, is I think we will increasingly see a se separation between 
ESG conform uh, uh, kind of future uh, uh, businesses and others. It is very difficult for a company to hold both because they risk being punished for, for still being polluting and having a declining business and a, and a high cost. And that on the other hand, they also not get the benefit of a Tesla, of a super high valuation for all the, for all the hype of, of, of getting, into, getting into it. And that holds for oil and gas, that holds for steel, that holds for um, even defense companies. Uh, I think you will see, especially in the public space, a clear separation of companies completely embracing the energy and the, uh, the, the energy transition and being the green ones and the other ones being the brown ones or the even black ones who are need to be managed down. Automobile sector. Okay, real quickly, I'm gonna go back to the, to the question about the uh, millennials and, and preferences. There was actually a survey of CEOs in 2008 where they said, and they referred to this as CSR back then, but they said that the employees were the ones that were really pushing the most for this. And, um, and then there's, a, there's a, a nice piece of research um, th that looking at Swedish employees, and they will work for less pay in order to work for a, for a, a company that has a better reputation um, in, in the ESG, or ENS, I think. Thank you very much. And this note of hope, we'll, we'll finish the, the panel. And I think it's time for lunch.